history Unraveling the mystery that all started with a Big Bang this is Science Friday. I am Ira Plato. My guest today is responsible for the discovery of the first stable super heavy element. Welcome, Dr. Sheldon Cooper. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the university made me come here. I didn't want to. <laughs> A big fan of the show. Ira Flato's appearances on the hit sitcom The Big Bang Theory created lighthearted laughter. But Flato has spent more than three decades making science and climate change relevant on his popular radio program, Science Friday. I'm Melody Hunter-Pillion, a Global Change Fellow and doctoral student in public history at North Carolina State University. And my name is Stephanie Kelly, a dual master's student in landscape architecture and climate change in society. I'm also a Global Change Fellow. Today, Ira Flato is a special guest of the Southeast Climate Science Center's Global Change Fellowship Program. We're discussing the art of science communication with a focus on climate change. Ira, we are happy and so honored to have you. Could you start off by telling us just a little bit about your work and your mission to make science accessible to everyone? Well, I, I've been doing uh, science reporting for, I'm going to say, 50 years now, ever since I was in college and, and starting in college with the first Earth Day. And um, I have found that people love science. I mean, there's a mythology that, oh, I hate science because I don't understand it and I can't do math and I don't know it. And I can't dissect a frog and I don't know what, you know, well, what the charts show me. But that may all be true that people don't understand the details, but they love science and they love to talk about it. We have proven that on Science Friday where, you know, we have two million people every week who are listening on podcasts or the radio or whatever, and they really do want to talk about science. It's no mystery to me why a show like The Big Bang Theory, which is really highly, you know, a lot of physics going on there. I was on the show three times uh, talking about, you know, science on Science Friday. It's the number one show and is the number one show on television. Why is that? Because they know that people want to talk about science. And so when we started Science Friday and when I started doing it in my career, I just found ways of doing it uh, that people can understand it. And when they understand it, you know, you'll, you'll see how much they like it. When we talk about science and the science of climate change in particular, there's still a lot of skepticism out there. Ira, could you please talk a bit about the role of the media in communicating science? Yes. Um, I'm a great believer in local news reporting. Um, if you look at the statistics, most people get their news on television at the 6, 10 or 11 o'clock evening news. And if, if news reporters start covering how climate change is affecting them locally, whether rising prices due to um, droughts or, or, or falling crop yields uh, for wildfires and, 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 and actually start linking it to climate change, then people will see how relevant it is. Signs and symptoms of climate change are all and around And because us. of climate change, hurricanes like Harvey are probably going to become more Again, common. Again, it's called precipitation whiplash and it has to do with climate change. They're calling it baked Alaska. And while it is a treat, it's no dessert. I really get upset sometimes when you see, you see that climate change happening, but you're not making the link to the event and to the change in climate, the climate crisis we're in. I think we need to see more of that. And when that happens, I think people will be able to understand it a little better. I think they're making the link themselves, you know, in their own minds. Um, but I think we, we need to see the media make more of that link more forcefully. But in order to do so effectively, scientists need to help the media relay these messages in a way that the public can understand. And that means being mindful of jargon and burdensome technical terms. Here's a Science Friday clip featuring public engagement expert Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz, founder and director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. When you hear scientists talk about climate change, there are some words and phrases that get brought up a lot, right? Like mitigation, carbon neutral, and tipping point. They are often used to explain how far we are in the climate crisis. You find them a lot in reports meant to discuss climate change with the public. Maybe you've heard these terms on, well, on this very show. I mean, in many ways, this is very much consistent with what we've learned over many decades of research on science communication, and that is you've got to keep it simple. You've got to use terms that people do understand in their everyday language. 
Uh, and I would just say that you know this is a very common problem for all of us, and then we call this the veil of knowledge. Not the veil of ignorance, but the veil of knowledge. And that once you come to be an expert in something, and it could be anything, it could be auto mechanics, that you tend to assume that everybody around you understands what you understand. Because often we just assume because of this veil of knowledge that everybody on, around us knows what carbon dioxide is, that knows what mitigation or adaptation are, when in fact many people really don't know what these terms are because they've never encountered them, quote unquote, in the wild. They don't hear the people that they know, their friends, their families, uh, their local communities talking about it. They don't tend to hear it from the media that they're paying attention to. As the expert on your show pointed out, there's a need to bridge the gap in climate change science communication and to normalize it. Can you talk about how your Degrees of Change program is aiming to do just that? Yeah, I was noticing that um, we needed to talk about climate change more, and we needed to talk about it in a way that uh, talk that it is changing and how do we deal with it? And so we started the Degrees of Change series and made sure that we had a local element in it. We do a series also called the State of Science, which we try to bring local stories into, uh, into a national spotlight. And because all of um, the, the weather and the climate is really local, what's happening locally, we thought we could integrate our state of science into a sort of degrees of change state. Ira, what are some of the uh, more inspirational stories that listeners have shared about their own personal experiences with climate change that you found to be the most compelling? I think the, the most obvious degrees of change or the most obvious climate stories, I think, are the wildfires in California or out west. And now they, we used to talk about them just in California now they're up and down the coast. And, and then there's the drought in the Southwest. And when you see people losing their homes because of these wildfires, uh, that is those are really personal stories. Um, and they hit it. The impact is immediate. We don't have to tell you. We just have to show you or listen to the stories and hear their personal accounts. And it become, becomes obvious. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. In the West, a number of factors, including climate change, have turned fire season into a nearly year-round affair. 911, state emergency. We're at Wagner's campground, and uh -huh. it looks like there's a fire south uh, by where the lake is. Which, which lake are you at, sir? Cool. Man is cool lake. Do you see flames from where you are right now? Every In every direction, yes. How many, approximately how many people are down there, approximately? I want to say 150 to 200 people. Okay. But we have burn, burn victims, and we okay. have a girl that's severely burned. We are literally, we have people running to the lake, like on foot, running to the lake as fast as they can because there's fire everywhere. There's fire on both sides of the truck. There's no one driving through the fire. Ira, you hear stories like these, and they're just heart-wrenching. Yet there's still so many people who feel disconnected from climate change and are dismissive of the issues. Why do you think that is? I think people become dismissive because the people that they listen to in their tribe don't, don't really want to talk about science and don't want to give it uh, the kind of uh, attention it deserves. Thinking more broadly about how these discussions are playing out and the polarizing effect of politics on perceptions of climate change, could you talk a bit about how science can be transformative in leading a paradigm shift? You know, science has a really interesting way of... Um, not caring about what your politics is. So when climate change happens, it's now almost impossible to look around you and not see it happening. And so your mind is having, you know, if you don't believe in climate change, your mind's having a bit of a problem. The logical side of your brain is saying, look, you know, the oceans are rising, the hurricanes are getting stronger, it's all coming true. And then your emotional side might say, yeah, but I'm not supposed to believe in this. That's how we knew we began in a paradigm shift. Uh, in terms of climate change or when science gets to be believed more. You know, when people, in, intelligent people who may have real political differences but are uh, curious and they want to find the truth, will actually go and look at it and find out where the truth is. And I, that seems very hopeful for me. There are some people who you're never going to change their minds no matter what you say. And the statistics bears this out. That's why during election seasons, they're always looking for the uncommitted voter, you know, because they think maybe that's somebody that could change their mind. But that's one of the most frustrating things in doing my job is I can present people with the facts 
or not the fact, because everybody has their own facts, I can present you with the evidence that may be indisputable. And, and think, and I thought this in my early career, if I just told the truth and showed the evidence, it would change people's minds. You can't. The thing that will change people's minds, at least a bit, are the friends of people. This research shows that maybe not your relatives. You know, Uncle Charlie may not you know, be able to convince you, but your next door neighbor or your friends on Facebook may be able to influence your thinking and how you change your mind. And that, so we're hopeful about science that way for people who don't really have faith in science. Maybe um, as, as, as science marches on and we get new ideas coming out, those things will win out. And from the Sci-Fi Vox app, listener Jordan H. shared this. My tips for talking about climate change with people who don't agree with me is to start off with talking about their opinion first. This way I can get an understanding of how they feel and then I can voice my opinion. It is okay to have different opinions. There is no need to start an argument over it. You two can feed off of each other's views and learn from each other's opinions. Another tip I have is to focus on the facts and the science of it, but it's okay to use some humor. A very famous website called um, I effing luck love science. The last time I looked and because this was the like years ago, the last time I looked, it had 25 million visits. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> you know, it's probably up to 50 now or something because that shows that people really do want to, you know, talk about science. You just have to find it, talk about it in the most interesting way. And one example of what we just did last week, we did a show on, on butts, you know, <laughs> rear ends. <laughs> There, and we didn't do it from people at people's angle. There are some very tiny little animals that some of them have a hundred of them. As you probably know, if you listen to the show, we're big fans of the microbiome, microbes that live in the gut. But one related subject that we don't talk about as much is what happens at the end of the gut. Yeah, I'm talking about what even scientists call the butt. But what is a butt anyway? And why are so many scientists celebrating it for a whole week? It was really interesting science about why, why some of these organisms have the butt here, but there, why they need them. <laughs> and I was just at a meeting yesterday uh, when we follow statistics. That has been the number one followed story in the last, I don't know how many years that we have done. And it shows if you, you know, if you can find a way to talk about stuff that in the way that people will, will find interesting and then learn the science that's the challenge it's a great <laughs> great story and it was done in a very humorous humorous way also the scientists were delightful i mean they were they were having fun talking about their own work and that's one of the secrets to to science communication also is finding scientists who are good speakers who because in in radio in the media there is body language and voice language that's conveyed more probably than the content. And if you find scientists who convey their interest and their joy and their love for what they're doing, that, that makes the audience think, hey, maybe there's more to it than the, I think that you know, the, these nerdy people are, or they're not <laughs> as nerdy as I thought they were. You know? Maybe I should look into that more. That's why some of the great popularizers of science were you know, good speakers. And had, and had sort of a gimmick that they, they used. Good evening. Joining me tonight, a climate change denier and, naturally, Bill Nye science guy. <laughs> uh, so, Bill. Bill? John? Yep. Humans are causing climate change? No wait, question. Wait, 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 wait. Before we begin, on, in the interest of mathematical balance, I'm going to bring out two people who agree with you, climate skeptic. And Bill Nye, I'm also going to bring out 96 other scientists. <laughs> uh, it's a little unwieldy, but this is the only way you can actually have a representative discussion. Uh, so that was a clip from last <laughs> week tonight featuring another beloved science communicator, <laughs> Bill Nye the Science Guy. A little humor certainly does go a long way. <laughs> it does. Ira, we want to thank you so much. You've been wonderful and generous in sharing your time with us today. Any final thought you'd like to leave us with? The final thought is that our kids are the future, and we have to make sure that we take care of that future by taking care of our kids and making sure they have the freedom to experiment, the freedom to think for themselves, and to teach them how to think for themselves. Yeah. To teach them, you know, sometimes I don't like to call it science. I like to, talk, to call it critical thinking. Because we have to know how to listen to what's being told to us, question it, and then try to 
figure out the answer for ourselves by knowing how to critically think about it and doing doing the research to determine whether it's it's true or not. Because that's basically what science is. Science is the process of collecting the data to prove what you think is real. That's all of our time. Thanks so much for listening. And thanks again to our special guest, Ira Flato. We want to encourage you all to share your own personal climate change stories and experiences on the SciFry Vox app and in your own communities. If you want to know more about the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center and the Global Change Fellowship Program, please visit secasc.ncsu.edu. This educational podcast was made possible thanks to the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, Science Friday's Ira Flato, and NC State University Library's digital media team. With supporting clips from SciFry Program, the Big Bang Theory, Last Week Tonight, ABC, and USA Today news coverage. It's